Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisance as all glory to Shri Prabhupada. Welcome to devotees to morning Bhagavatam class. This morning we will be continuing with Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 1, Chapter 10, Verse 27. And we are very glad to have His Holiness Chandramali Swami with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you and all glory to Shri Prabhupada. Uh, well, yeah. Yesterday we began a series of lectures on uh, Ram Leela leading up to his appearance day, which is in, on Thursday. Would you like me to change the verse, Marsh? Because that's... <laughs> well, actually, I won't even use a verse. I'll just... All right, Marsh, that's fine. Sure, I will get that out. No problem. Okay, so... And I request devotees, since we are not sharing, if we can please, if anyone is possible, to please show your videos. That way we can see each other. Thank you. Okay, so um, yesterday I just gave a very short overview of the Ramayan. What is it? Some of its features, some of the qualities of Ram, uh, the benefits of uh, taking advantage of this great scripture, and uh, just a little bit about some of the details of the actual Lila, which we didn't even hardly touch. So today, I'm going to uh, speak a little bit about how it all unfolded. The Leelas started in a very interesting way. Um, in order to make things very uh, clear, there's, I'm going to read a little bit. And this reading is a description of what Ayodhya was like during the time of Dasarat's rule, prior to the appearance of uh, his son, Lord Ramachandra. I'll begin the reading. Mm -hmm. The great tract of land known as Koshalya extended along the banks of the Sarayu River. The land was verdant, prosperous, and rich in grain. Within this vast territory was the renowned city of Ayodhya, built by the desire of Vaivishwatumanu, the ruler of mankind. This glorious city was 96 miles long and 24 miles wide. It was well laid out and its beautiful straight roads were perfumed with scented waters sprayed from the trunks of intoxicated elephants. Every day, the damsels of the celestial planets hovered above it in their beautiful airplanes and showered it with flowers. The arch gateways of Iodia were made of marble, and the gates were worked with gold and silver and embedded with precious jewels. Cannons and catapults, capable of repulsing any enemy, protected the city walls. The marketplaces were well planned, and seven story houses symmetrically lined the streets, adorned with multi storied palaces and surrounded with exquisite gardens, Iodius resounded with the vibration of musical instruments, rivaling Armavati, the abode of the heavenly King Indra. Throughout the city, bards and singers recited the glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and dancers acted, at, acted out the Lord's pastimes for everyone's benefit. Within Ayodhya, there were many beautiful gardens abounding with flowers and shaded by fruit trees. Blue, red, and golden lotuses filled the ponds and fountains shot water high in the air. Gentle, br gentle breezes carried the aromatic spray from the fountains, cooling the citizens by their touch and making even a hot summer day seem like spring. The sounds of cranes and peacocks could be heard everywhere. The water flowing from Myodia streams and rivulets tasted as sweet as sugarcane sap. And it was used not only for drinking, but for irrigating numerous mangoes or mango orchards. 
Many houses and palaces, perfectly designed, were built with precious stones and decorated with flags and festoons. Their beauty rivaled the palaces of Vaikuntha. Thousands of warriors protected the great city. Skilled archers, well-versed in the use of weapons, and chariot fighters who were able to fight with thousands of men at a time. The streets leading into Ayodhya were always filled with travelers. Kings and princes from all over the world came to render their annual tribute and pay respects to the king of Ayodhya. Traders from near and far flocked to the market to barter. Brahmin priests could often be seen pouring ghee into the sacrificial fires and chanting Vedic hymns, proclaiming the glories of Lord Vishnu. Having mastered their senses and devoted themselves to truth, these Brahmins were blessed with all good qualities. Maharaj Dasarat was the emperor of the entire world and was a great Rajarsi, considered almost on the level of a Mahara Maharshi. He was a formidable warlord, capable of fighting alone and with an unlimited number of opponents because, because he was the citizens, because he and the citizens were completely pious. Ayodhya was the perfect picture of Vedic civilization. Every imaginable opulence was exhibited in perfection and material miseries coming from the results of sinful activities were practically non-existent. In Ayodhya, the four social orders, namely these Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishyas, and Sudras participated cooperatively for the peace and prosperity of the kingdom. No one cheated and no one was mis miserly. Arrogance, atheism, and harsh behavior and speech were conspicuous by their absence. So I can give you a little description of the city of Ayodhya prior to the appearance of Ram. But this whole description leads up to one thing that despite all of this grandiose opulence and auspiciousness and much devotion to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Dasarat, the king, was unhappy. And he one day called his ministers together. He had decided, I am unhappy because I don't have an heir to the throne. I'm getting on in age and I still don't have a son who will succeed and take over the kingdom. Now we understand from, from basic knowledge that for a king to have a, a son is important and essential in order for that prince to become the next ruler. And so Dasarat was, was quite in this, the despair, feeling he had tried everything, but no son would appear. And so he was lamenting. Then he thought, perhaps if I perform a horse sacrifice, a asphameda yagya, then maybe that will bring auspiciousness. And maybe by that auspiciousness, the, the gods will be happy and bless me with the sun. And so he called his ministers and asked their permission if he should do such a sacrifice. Now here's a great king who's quite knowledgeable, the leader and quite worshipful, but still he consults his ministers when in times of need. And so that is also one of the qualities of a great leader. When it comes to maybe making important decisions, he always consults his Brahmin class in order for them to give the advice. Now he had an idea. Yes, I will perform an Athamata Yagya, which is very auspicious. And uh, therefore, the gods will be pleased with me if it becomes successful, and then perhaps they'll bless me with a you know, a prince. And so he consulted his ministers. They all agreed, yes, my dear king, this is a very good decision. And so 
then uh, Dasarat became somewhat inspired and happy. Then at one point, right after that, his chariot driver, Sumantra, came to him and said, my dear Dasarat, um, in order for this uh, Asvamedha Yagya to actually occur, you're going to have to bring a very special person who is not in this kingdom in order to, to uh, officiate this sacrifice. And uh, Dasra asked, well, who was that? Well, his name is Rishishringa. He is a forest dweller, but he is a pure soul. You remember you gave your daughter Shanti, Shanta to your king, king friend, Romapad Maharaj. Now, Romapad Maharaj and Dasarat were close friends. So when Romapad didn't have any children in order to make him feel happy, Dasarat had one daughter named Shanta. And so he gave that daughter to Romapad to live at Romapad's kingdom. Now, the situation was that Romapad's kingdom was under a very severe drought. The drought was so severe that it seemed like nothing auspicious would ever happen. And people were really, really suffering for lack of water. So, um, in the kingdom of uh, Romapad, his ministers came and said to him, my dear Romapad, there's only one way you can dissipate this inauspicious drought. And that is you have to bring Rishishringa out of the forest and have him marry your daughter Shanta. And together they can perform a sacrifice. And by that sacrifice, then rains will come. But the problem was Rishishringa was living in the forest and he was very much protected by his father Mriga Rishi, who was uh, not going to allow his son, the son was pretty much a teenage boy now, and he also had two horns growing out of his head. He was quite an unusual person. <laughs> uh, his father wanted to protect him, and, and so Rishi Shringen never saw any other person in his whole life except his father. The only person he ever saw, father protected him in that way. And so now the, uh, the solution was given, but now how to uh, make it happen. And so um, the ministers told, well, you have to allure Rishi Shringa out of the forest. So here is a plan. Send some of the best prostitutes you have in the kingdom and bring to have them bring very nice gifts and food and go into the forest and try to allure uh, Rishishring away. Of course, that was a little dangerous because his father was always around. So the plan was made and the girls left, three girls, and they left. And they had this basket of nice sweets and they were de decorated very nicely themselves. And they looked very, very attractive. Now they set up a little camp nearby where Rishi Shringa was living. And they waited till his father went to the forest to collect food for, uh, for cooking. So at that time they came and then uh, they said, oh, Rishi Shringa, um, uh, we have some nice gifts for you. Now he was thinking, who are these persons? I've never seen persons like them before. They look very nice. And they look, they also smell so nicely. What kind of men are these? He had never saw a woman in his life, so he never knew what a woman looked like. <laughs> and so, they started to speak very sweetly, sing songs to him, and give him nice 
of flowers and sweets. And the boy was starting to become very much attracted to it. And then uh, he was very happy to meet these persons. And then the girls were wondering, we can't take too long because if his father comes back and he, we get caught, it'll be, it'll ruin the whole thing. So they decided to leave. Now, Richard Schringer really enjoyed the company of these persons, but he couldn't understand who they were. What kind of men were these? So these girls, before they left, they each embraced him very nicely and they left. Now they left and then, now Risha Shringa, his mind was somewhat changed. Being a very staunch brahmachari, living in the forest, never seeing a girl in his life performing austerities and living simply on roots and fruits and whatever his father could collect. Now his mind was, was feeling a little sensual and disturbed. He couldn't understand what it was that was disturbing him in that way. But, and then he, but, but at the same time, he felt such a strong attraction for those girls. So those girls had set up their camp not so far from his ashram. So the next day, his father went out again. This time he left and went to find the girls. Of course, they were nearby. And they said, oh, Rishi, you have come. We want to take you to where we live. So he came and they brought him to the kingdom of Romapod. At that time, the boy was completely changed. His, his feelings of sensuality, his feelings of attraction for the opposite sex were really strong. At that time, Romapod Swami came and spoke to him and said, uh, my dear Rishi Sringa, I have a beautiful girl for you to marry. She's my daughter. Please accept your hand, her hand in marriage. And immediately Rishi Sringa did. And there was a marriage between Shanta and Rishi Sringa. Right after that, he performed the sacrifice. And by that sacrifice, the rains came. In fact, even before the sacrifice began, there were signs of rain everywhere. Because Indra was very pleased, and then he decided to shower rain because Krishna Sringa was such a, a staunch uh, devotee that by that by his appearance in the kingdom brought about auspiciousness. Now Sumantra is telling you know Dasarat about this Krishna Sringa. He said, if you want to uh, perform this uh, Asphrameda Yagya. You have to bring Rishi Shringa along with your daughter. And so uh, Dasarat went to the kingdom of Romapad and explained the situation. Romapad was happy and said, yes. Actually, then he explained to Rishi Shringa that actually this is your real father-in-law because Shanta is her, is his daughter. So he came to the kingdom and then all the preparations were made for the Asparameda Yagya. Koshalya was the chief queen, and therefore she officiated the ceremony along with Rishi Shringa. And then uh, the Asparameda Yagya was performed, and um, the horse was um, relieved of his particular body because those, those Yagyas, they kill the horse, but the horse, again, comes back in another form, in a more auspicious form, and sometimes in a, in a human form. So um, the Yagya was very successful by everyone could understand. It was auspiciously, it brought auspicious everywhere. But then uh, that wasn't enough. So they had to perform another ceremony, and this Sumantra said, you have to perform the Putreshi Yagya, where there is a fire sacrifice performed, and he described it, and Rishi Shringa will preside over that, which he did. And when that Putreshi ceremony was performed, there was a, uh, out of the fire, out of the, out of the sacrificial fire, uh, uh, 
close the curtain. Out of the sacrificial fire, a uh, a golden person. I know, I'm sorry, a, a, a very black person with carrying a very beautiful, big golden pot appeared. And he presented that pot to Dasarat. In that pot was a thing called Havasyana, Havasyana, which is something like a sweet rite preparation. The instructions was given by Rishi Shringa that you take these, this, this Havasyana, and you'll give it to your three principal queens, Koshalya, Kaikeyi, and Sumitra. Now it's interesting because just before that pot was delivered to the queens, a particular bird came from nowhere and flew and took part of that Havasyana in its beak and flew away. That that bird actually was coming from the area of, of um, Humpy, where Anjana Putra, Anjana was, I'm sorry, Anjana, she was a, a fallen uh, demigoddess who was living in the forest. And he delivered that bird, delivered that Havishyana to Anjana. She ate it, and of course, later on, Hanuman was born. His Hanuman is called Anjana Putra, the son of Anjana and Keshari, Prince Keshari. And so that was this, that Havasyana was distributed. And it says that for, uh, uh, Koshalya was giving half the preparation, and Sumitra. Uh, his other wife was giving a quarter, and then uh, and you no, know, and Kaikeyi was given a quarter, and but Kaikeyi divided her quarter and gave a portion to. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it was given to uh, Sumitra, and then she gave a portion to Kaikeyi. So from Kaushalya, later on, very soon after that. Four illustrious sons who were incarnations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead manifested. It says that they were non different from Vasudev, Sankarsana, Aniruddha, and Pradyuma, the, the Vishnu feature that manifest themselves in the spiritual world in Vaikuntha. They are also said that they are the four weapons of Vishnu, which are the Kanch the disc, the club, and lotus flower. So these four personalities appeared, divine births, and they now appeared into the kingdom of Dasarat. Of course, when Dasarat heard that the delivery was there with all of the uh, children, he was very, very happy. His whole life became now successful. His happiness reached no limit. Now he had. And because Oshaya was the principal queen, he accepted that the, the person from her womb would be the king, the next king. And that was, of course, Lord Ramchandra. So this describes in a very succinct and very short way the birth of um, Lord Ram. Uh, in the Ramayana, much more detail is given that center around these activities that we described. But this is the essence of that particular pastime. And of course, the boys grew up. They were very playful, sometimes also a little mischievous. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but they were the sinosaur of everyone in the kingdom, especially Ram. Ram stood out among, amongst all of the, the, the children as the most intelligent, the most well-behaved, and the most talented in many of the uh, activities of a upcoming prince. And so Dasarat could understand that, but that, that this boy would be the next king, and he felt that he had made the perfect choice.
Now, we speak a little bit about Dasarad. Dasarat was um, his name, Dasa Rata. Dasa means 10 and Rata means chariot. And he could fight with 10 chariot, powerful chariot warriors at a time and defeat them all. In fact, his chariot would move so fast that no one could even see it when he was fighting. So he was um, you know, an expert fighter. One day when he was in the forest, he was hunting because it is the, it is the sport of the Kshatriyas to practice their ability in archery to hunt. So he was in the forest and then he heard a sound by a lake and he had thought that this was an animal drinking water there. He didn't see the animal, he just heard the sound. But he was so adept in his ability to fire arrows that simply by, by pointing his arrow in the direction of the sound, he fired an arrow. But unfortunately, it wasn't an animal. It was a young boy who was just, you know, maybe about 12 years old. And this, the arrow struck the boy and he was wounded mortally. There was a cry and then Dasarat uh, came to see and he realized what a mistake he had made. And the boy was dying. Now the boy, one of his main service was to take care of his parents who were both blind. So he would do all of it just to take care of his parents. And now the parents wouldn't have anyone to protect them or care for them. So the boy, when he was dying, he said, because you have, you have killed me, um, I all that at one point, your son, you will also have to die because my, he said, my parents will die also because they will, because of the loss of me. But because you have done this sinful act, you at one point will lose your own son also. And so he cursed him. Of course, that curse came true when Ram was banished in the forest for 14 years and Dasarat suffered so much during that separation that he could no longer live and he left his body. So that curse took effect. <laughs> the boy was a Brahmin. And so when a Brahmin gives a curse, we also have the story of Shringi who cursed Maharaj Parikshit when apparently Maharaj Parikshit had apparently uh, made some uh, wrong activity toward Shringi's father, Shamak Reese, by placing a dead snake around the, the Rishi's body when the Rishi didn't respond to the king's desire for water. So and that boy was only 12 years old. So you see, Brahmins, especially in those days, they had, they had the power to curse or they had the power to give a benediction. So people would seek out very carefully the favor of the Brahmins because if the Brahmins gave a benediction, if the Brahmins gave something, said something, it would actually come true because a Brahmin is one who lives simply for glorification and service of the Supreme Personality Godhead and to give guidance for the population in general. It says in the days of in days of Vedic culture, the Brahmins would tour around, going to people's houses. People would welcome in the Brahmins. The Brahmins would be given some water and some food. And then they would, being pleased with the hospitality of the Trihasta family, they would give blessings for either a new child, auspiciousness in the home, or they would also... Uh, speak of, in an astrological way, talking about the future of the family like that. And of course, if there was some medicine that was needed, they would also give medicine. So they would give knowledge. They would give 
uh, medical care, uh, medical advice, and astrological advice. So this, and because they had no means of occupation, they were supported by the people that they, they cared for or they blessed. Now that was Vedic culture where Brahmins were uh, free to go everywhere and anywhere and they were respected. Of course, nowadays, the whole Brahminical culture has been lost. There are some Brahmins, some in places, different places in the world to today, who are actually real Brahmins. But because of the effects of Kali Yuga, the Brahmin class has gone down and has taken the occupation of the Kshatriyas or even of the Vaishyas in order to maintain themselves. And because society no longer even respects the Brahminical culture, of course, in some places they still do. It depends where you go, right? Places within India or similar areas of the world where Vedic culture is still very strong. But mostly it's all gone <laughs> because of the effects of Kali Yuga, which deteriorates, as it says in the Bhagavatam, all of the good qualities of the living entities in this age. In this age, people don't have hardly any good qualities. And if they have any good qualities, it is usually due to the family they were born in. But or it's due to their ac activities and devotion to the Lord. And so it's a very difficult age. And so it's hard to find a real Brahmin, <laughs> an actual Brahmin. Prabhupada started the Hare Krishna movement. And his whole program was to create a class of Brahmins. So he trained his devotees in that way, in Brahminical qualities, in Brahminical activities, such as worshiping the deity, such as uh, uh, performing various sacrifices, and also preaching the glories of the Lord. So Prabhupada trained very carefully and very, what we say, uh, tirelessly, his devotees in some of the in the culture. But of course, some of us came up to the standard, some of us didn't. But Prabhupada's whole idea was to first establish a Brahminical class by which the society could develop. Once the Brahmins are there. Cow protection is also a feature, and God consciousness is the main activity of the, the living entities. Then we create an ideal society within this age of Kali Yuga, which is very difficult to do because of the influence of the age. But Prabhupada was relentless. He was pure. He was uh, highly intelligent, knew how to do things from all angles of activity. And he worked very tirelessly in order to bring about a Brahminical class. So, so when the Brahmins are glorified, when the Brahmins are worshipped, when the Brahmins are given whatever they need to live nicely, then society flourishes. And that is called a Brahminical culture, a Brahminical society. And so... Uh, hmm. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. So uh, we see a king, a real king, a kshatriya, a real ruler, will always take advice from the Brahmins. Like that. We have the example within the Ramayan of uh, of Ravana. Ravana. We were talking a little bit about Ravana yesterday. His birth and the family of. Uh, of uh, the uh, sage Vishrava and his wife Vedashri, Vedashi, um, and how he was born. And but you no, know, Ravana was highly intelligent. He also knew the Vedas, but he was a demon. <laughs> he used Vedic knowledge to propagate his own selfish and demoniac programs. But one of the things as a leader, a powerful leader who had amassed a large kingdom with great amounts of wealth and followers, 
he would also go to his ministers for advice. And if he liked the advice, he would take it. If he didn't like the advice, he wouldn't take it. Keep it on for me. So you see, um, there are actually three types of choices a Kshatriya has when it comes for advice. One is they go to the Brahmins, ask for advice, and accept whatever they say. Ravana was not in that category. <laughs> Two is that the Kshatriya goes to the Brahmanas, asks for advice, and he takes it if he likes it. In other words, he'll, like, he'll get advice, and if he thinks the advice is very good, he takes it. And then there's the third class, who doesn't go and ask anyone, simply carries out his, his, his um, administrative affairs without any consultation with the Brahmanical class. So Robin was the second class. And many times, of course, we'll just fast forward a little by mentioning how when he uh, had captured Sita, the Brahmanas, many of his advisors, especially his own brother, uh, was giving advice. You know, you have everything. You don't. Why you have? The, why you want this woman here? She's going to be the, the the destruction of your whole kingdom. So just give her back and live happily. You got everything. You got power. You got wealth. You got followers. You got reputation. You got many queens already. Why couldn't Why couldn't Ravana hear all that? We'll make one point. Well, Krishna speaks in the Bhagavad Gita. What is that? He says it is lust and lust only that comes in contact with the material mode of passion, which it, and later is transformed into wrath, which is the all devour enemy of this material world. So it's this lust in, in the Bhagavad Gita. There is a caricature of lust as a burning fire. The lust is like that. It can never be satisfied. The more one tries to fulfill them or satisfy one's lusty desires, the stronger the lust gets. The analogy is given that if you take wood and you throw it onto the fire, just by placing it on the fire, the fire will go down for a little while because of the wood being placed. And but give it some time, and then the fire will the wood will catch and the fire will blaze even more. So fulfilling lust is like that. When we first try to fulfill it, what happens is the desire or that feeling of lusty desires goes down because there's some fulfillment, but give it some few minutes, few moments soon, because you cannot satisfy uh, one's desires by fulfilling one's desires. You can satisfy your, your desires, all material desires, that is, only by going to spiritual desires or giving up material desires and taking on higher, more, desires in the mode of goodness. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ravana could not understand that because he was laced, he was honeycombed with lusty desires. And therefore he had fixed his mind on the concert of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and he was, he was unchangeable. But because of that, he lost everything in his life. <laughs> so it's a great story, this, this Ramayan. We'll speak about it. There's hundreds of different messages that we can learn from hearing about the Ramayan. Tomorrow we'll speak again. And on Thursday, which is the actual day, we will also give a full narration of the whole, um, the whole episode in a very summarized version. It's hard to do that because this Ramayana is so long. It's 24,000 verses. It takes days and days to narrate it, but we'll try to do something. And that's with the devotees at uh, Charlotte. 
every other Thursday we do a class in one week in Harrisburg and one week in Charlotte. So Charlotte is this week, and that is um, where we do the whole. And tomorrow we will also speak some more, some more smaller pastimes in the Ramayan. Tomorrow we'll speak about Kaikei and her intrigue with Mantara and the plan to overthrow Dastarat's plan to establish Ram on the throne. And that's an interesting pastime. Okay, so we'll stop here. Thank you so much, Marge, for such a wonderful pastime. It's a few things that I know for me was like I did not know. So that was definitely a, a, a nice pastime to hear. And preparing us for the appearance of Lord Ram, which is like you said, in a couple of days. So thank you so much. Would like to ask devotees of any questions uh, that you picked up from this class. Um, as Marad said, there are lessons in every pastime that we hear that is to help us in our Krishna consciousness and to check ourselves. So if there are any questions, please raise your hand and um, I will call upon you in the order that the hands are being raised. Marge, when you were speaking about, um, which I didn't know actually, um, when the, 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 the bowl of porridge, the, the sweet rice that was distributed to the three uh, queens, because I think I also read somewhere, and I think it was the early verses in the, in the first canto of Bhagavatam, that King Dasarat had 350 wives. Yeah, I mentioned that yesterday. And, but he gave it only to the, the, the kid, to his, his first three principal wives. And this pastime mother with a march with a bird coming, is that part of the Leela or was that? Like, how did that play a part? Yeah, that was that was the birth of Hanuman. <laughs> because Hanuman is a Mahapurush. He's a great soul. <laughs> He's actually an energy of Lord Shiva. <laughs> In one of his manifestations and his appearance, <laughs> He became birth, he became born from the, the semen of Lord Shiva. And that is the pastime of Mohini Murti. So Hanuman appears each time when Ram appears. So, so that manifestations of this pastime they have a slightly different uh, angle or slightly different unfolding as they happen each time. So yeah, that's that's mentioned not too many places about that bird. Yes, I've never heard that Mark. And as it, it caught my attention. I never heard that. Yeah, obviously we arranged in that way, by higher powers. <laughs> Thank you, Maraj, for shedding some light on that. Thank you. Yes, Mother Scarlet, go ahead. Hare Krishna, please accept my humble open senses. All glories to Shri Prabhupada, all glories to your holiness, and all glories to all uh, the devotees. Um, I started something uh, in, in connection to uh, Ram's uh, uh, appearance day uh, that makes me wonder how is possible for us to uh, practice that. For instance, um, the food, uh, the preparing food, where it comes, rice comes from a very holy temple, uh, the jaggery comes from another holy temple, and so on and so on. And then the food prepares in another, the third holy place, and, and so on and so on. For us who lived in Kalyuga, in this situation we are, we don't know where, where the food actually really comes from, uh, where they have been uh, 
prepare it and so on and so on. And it is impossible for me to have a, a farm to, uh, to do it myself. So how, how can we do for, for us to be somewhat protected? Even I understand that the Prashad uh, or the temple, even the food uh, that prepares in, in uh, temple is coming from some, uh, this store that I go and buy the food. So what can I do for, for, to protect myself by using something so that may protect me so that I, I can progress in my spiritual uh, path better? If you want pure food, you have to grow it yourself, or you have to get it from farms, devotee farms. And that's the only answer. There's no others. If you get it from outside, you get pesticides and herbicides and various types of chemicals. And this food is packaged, it stays on the shelf. A lot of time it gets old, it loses its freshness. It's you know, you read the package, it's full of all kinds of ingredients that just to keep keep it give it shelf life. So you don't uh, so if you really want pure food, you gotta grow it yourself. There's no other. No, no other choice. But take whatever you get now and just offer it in devotion to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Pray for his mercy. It comes prashad. Um, try to get the quality, the best quality you can get and then offer it to the Lord. If you take prashad... Do I and then you're fine. I'm so sorry. Do I understand you right that if I prepare the food, uh, even even if it's uh, that I'm uh, pre uh, buying it from the store, if I prepare it and I uh, offer it to the Lord first, then it will be pure, right? Th have I understood it right? Well, at least it's prashad. That's the point. Releases Prashadam. You know, Prabhupada's program was to start our own farms and grow, up and grow our own food. He also said, and I this is a direct quote, he said, the food grown, food grown on our farms are a hundred times more nutritious than what you buy in the stores. He said that. That's an exact quote. And you'll see the difference if you, I mean, I, sometimes I get a chance to get such food and when I travel to certain places and you can see the difference. It's juicy, it's tasty. You feel, you feel nourished after you eat it. Some of this food here is not so nice, but we do our best. We offer it to Krishna, try to cook it with devotion. That's the most important thing. You have to eat somehow, but we are, as a society, we, we're, we're trying to move towards that self-sufficiency, which is becoming more and more of a need now, because for those of you who are not aware, many of the countries are no longer resupplying a lot of the food items that they had for years. Many of the shelves are empty, many of certain food items, some of the important ones are no longer available. So there's few food shortages coming up and it'll only get more. So it's not, a, in a pretty soon, it's not, not gonna be a matter of quality, it's gonna be a matter of scarcity. And that's also predicted in the age of Kali, that there will be no rice, there'll be no wheat, There'll be no sugar, there'll be no milk. This is in Srimad Bhagavatam, as Kali Yuga progresses. So the qualities of these things already are going down. And these are pretty much important part of food. Um, I'll give you an example. I just read it last night. For instance, um, devotees were, you know, offering true food to Prabhupada, and they were talking about rice. So rice, and then one 
one, one problem, someone came up with the subject matter of brown rice. And Prabhupada immediately said, brown rice is for animals. That's what he said. Brown rice is for animals. But then, as I read a little longer, the person who spoke it understood that if you get brown rice in India, is what they do, they parboil it first, and then they keep it, and then when you buy it, you, you cook it. And then a lot of the nutrition and the, and the benefits. And, but if you go to a, like the US, that was at least, now this was years ago, but it's still there. In the US, the, the brown rice is of better quality. So it's not like what you get in India. So yeah, so in different places around the world, you'll find the quality of food is different, but the most important thing is that we should consider eating pure food if we can. And if you can't just cook it as best you can, keep it simple and uh, keep it fresh. Don't keep food long, use it. The idea of refrigeration is a modern thing that has come in Vedic culture and there was no such thing as refrigeration because people would, would produce, store, of course, grains they would store, but vegetables and fruits and other items they would cook and use on the same day that they received it. So there wasn't any place for refrigeration. There was no need for refrigeration. So yeah, good luck. That's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you. I think Marge, as they say, to, to make the best of the bad bargain, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, that's what it means to live in this age. <laughs> yes, Marge. We're surrounded, by, we're surrounded by so many life-threatening ingredients. You know, I guess this 5G now with this, uh, this internet, this stuff, and I just saw a book couple of days ago, 5G and cancer. So they're putting this 5G everywhere now. And it's a fact it causes cancer. Mm -hmm. And if you're exposed to it for a sustained period of time, you can get cancer. It's like one devotee was telling me, he lives near a 5G tower, and near that tower, there's an apartment house. And uh, everybody in the apartment house at one time became sick. The whole, the whole apartment house were all sick because of the 5G. So this whole civilization is out. It's simply meant to kill you, that's all. That's why Prabhupada said, we have to develop our own society, farms, build these farms. And of course, we have our Vrindavan, we have our Mayapur, we have, we have Gita Nagari, we have New Vrindavan, we have a Saranagati, we have a lot of places, New Rajadam, many places around the world where devotees are living and working on farms and producing. But it's only a small portion of the percentage of our society. Most of us live in the cities and we go shopping and we buy we buy what the what the society offers to us. Thank you, Maharaj. Any other questions from devotees? Any questions that's coming in your mind, please do raise your hand and um, ask I. I I know. <clears throat> excuse me. I think I see some questions in the mind, trying to formulate <laughs> to come out. Marjorie, we've we've seen and we've heard few uh, renditions of Ramayan within Iskon. Which one, Marjorie, is the most bona fide or 
to the scriptures that I, the one that I know of that's very, very old, I don't know if it still exists, is by Krishna Dharma Das. But, and I've also read about one by Pona Pakna Das. But is there anything that's uh -huh. better than that, Marge, that's really done? Uh -huh. Yeah, the one I like is the one by Subha Vilas. Okay. Uh, and uh, he's, he's finished it. Uh, and I read every book. As soon as the book came out, I, I, I read it and finished it as fast as I could. It was so engrossing. So his remind that he's compiled is a combination of Valmiki's Marayan, Valmiki's Ramayan, and uh, another person who wrote the Ramayan called Kumbi. <laughs> Kumbi was from the Sri Sampradaya, and he wrote a version of the Ramayan also. When he wrote it, uh, it was questionable amongst his peers. You're writing the Ramayan of the law. What would, what, what's how can we say it's authorized? So he said, all right, we'll make a test. We'll bring it before the Lord and we'll offer prayers to the Lord and we'll ask the Lord to give his opinion. So they had a deity of Lord Nishringadev. This was in the Sri Rangam temple. Not Sri Rangam, but in, was it? yeah, this is Sri Rangam. And it's a big compound, there's many, many deities there. So they brought the Ramayan in front of the deities, they all prayed. And uh, at one point, Lord Nishringa, they, he was sitting in a yoga position, he was yoga Nishringa, and he threw his arm up in the air, so the deity actually moved, and he placed his arm straight up in the air, giving sanction that this Ramayan is bona fide. <laughs> so then it was accepted in that way. <laughs> Maharaj, there's a question here. Um, is Tulsi Das Ramayan bona fide? Hmm. We'll answer it in one minute. I'm going to take some medicine here. Uh, not medicine, but something like medicine. Yeah, I'll be right with you. I've got to take it. So, is Tosi Das's Ramayan bona fide? Well, as far as literary embellishment and poetic expression, it's the most beautiful Ramayan. Especially if you read Sita's Sita marriage, really amazing. But Prabhupada says that in the Tulsi Ramayan, there are some aspects of impersonalism that he includes within the So it has tinges of impersonalism in, in it. So therefore, generally we stick to Valmiki's Ramayan. Marja, I remember um, the, the same question was asked of me last week and I remember uh, 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 seeing a letter on vaniquotes.org that Sri Prabhupada wrote to a devote Raktak Prabhu, I think is his name. That was a, yes, 1969, Maharaj. Sri Prabhupada wrote to him and told him uh, that Tulsi Das Ramayan has a tinge, as you said, of the Mayavadi philosophy. And he says, and Prabhupada told his devotee, you don't have to go anywhere. You, you just follow Srimad Bhagavatam, Valmiki's Ramayan, and that's all. Don't have to go anywhere else, is what he said. Yeah. Now we have some bona fide Mar Ramayans out. I, you know, for years, every year I was reading um, 
Krishna Dharma version, which is really good. He he has that ability to say a lot in a little bit. And there's a certain writing expertise where they know how to use words and they can say so much in so little words. It's called, it's the art of writing. It's the art of speech also. So his Ramayan is a favorite. And it's the one I was reading every year. Now I read, now I have another one I came across, which is the verses of the Ramayan. This is done by Vidva, Vidvan Goranga from, uh, from uh, Mayapur. He lives in Mayapur. I just saw him when I was there. And he gave me some of the later editions of his work. He's done it. Kanda by Kanda, using verse by verse with her words. It is really, it's a deluxe set. You know, there's going to be about maybe 30 books in the whole million. So it's beautiful. And he's, you know, he's really, really qualified to do the work. I, I was just looking up his books, Marsh, and it's Vidvan Goranga. Yes. Mayapur Institute Orc. Yes, I, I see his books in Ramayan. That's the one I'm gonna try to tackle next. But it's it's like volumes and volumes and volumes, you know. So I have about 10 volumes of the books already. And each volume is like 300 pages or more. Thank you, Marge. So, Prish Prabhu, I'll take your question and then go back to Mother uh, Scarlet, please. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. Oh, gross to Jira Prabhupada. Um, I was listening to Krishna Dharma's Ramayana as well as the audiobook version. And I wanted to ask, like, from the Sanskrit verses to how he's made it into a sto story form, what gives a person the ability or authority to do that? Like, you have the Sanskrit verses and then you made a much bigger kind of story out of it. Guru. It can only by come, comes with blessings of the guru. Otherwise, yeah. No, it says no one can write transcendental literature unless they are empowered by the Lord. So that's what makes it bona fide. Yeah. Well, that, that gives them the... Uh, the the uh, authority to write. Otherwise, there's a lot of people who just write books. Mm. But to write books, Prabhupada said it's the duty of the sannyasis to produce books. And of course, he wanted others to write books also. But he says that the tr our tradition is that we write books on the books that have already been written. In other words, uh, the Goswamis took the teachings of Lord Chaitanya and wrote all of their books, especially on the Shikshastika prayers. They expanded the Shikshastika prayers into all of their writings. And uh, Prabhupada said, yeah, my disciples should write books on my books. So yeah, so in other words, explaining even from different angles of vision, what Prabhupada has said, and that is, that is, uh, that is our tradition, and that is our 
a pro way for proliferation of the knowledge for different types of people. So you got for again, for instance, you have Krishna Dharma. Again, he's doing the Bhagavatam in story form, which is really good. Uh, he asked me to do the introduction or the forward for the seventh canto I did. Um, and they, uh, so he's using what is called, uh, what's the word? It's called um, writer's lead way or something. I forgot the noise, the technical term, which means taking taking ex, using extra information that is not part of the story to support the story. What is it called? Shudrav is supposed to poetic license. Yeah, poetic license. Yeah. Yeah, so Sri Krishna Dharma has done that with the Bhagavatam. Quite, it's quite nice. You can get copies on Amazon. Or since you're in, in London, you may be able to find it in Bhaktivedanta Manor. Thank you, Maharaj. That's really helpful. Clarified a lot for me. Krishna Dharma is quite brilliant in writing. He's really, really brilliant. If Maharaj, he even wrote the Mahabharat, which I think was the first one that he wrote. It was, it was, uh, I couldn't read the whole because it was so much. But I remember uh, our first daughter, Manoharini, she read it when she was 10 years or 12 years because she was so glued to it. And it was, she was telling us stories from it as she was reading it. <laughs> it was such an amazing book. Yeah, he knows how to write in such a way that it captures your attention. Absolutely. I haven't read that one. That, I put that on my list, but I haven't read that to it. Yeah, Brenda read that. But that, that was the first book I think she read was the Mahabharata by Krishna Dharma. That she wanted it so bad. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, He's Sri, all... Sri Swami read it and he was, he was glorifying it. You, you you were saying something, Silkish? Oh, no, I was just saying, um, I've got his audiobook version of it. It's like 35 hours. Long wow. Long read, read by himself. So it's nice to listen to our bedtime. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that he had an audiobook. Well, that's good yeah, to know. Yeah, they're all available on uh, Amazon on Audible. Okay, good to know. Yeah, yeah I think he's Marabarats as well. As, uh, sorry, not Marabarats, Bhagwatam as well. Oh, good. Good to know. He's a Ramayan too, also. I learned something new today. Those yes, of you, Mother, sorry, Marge. Yeah, those of you who like to hear, who find it difficult to read, then audiobooks are there. Thank you, Marge. Uh, Mother Scarlett, go ahead. Yes, uh, I have uh, two uh, questions. One is very, very little, and one is more uh scribing first and then the question the first one is how about uh, valmiki ramayana is it okay to read that uh, valmiki ramayana uh who is i i believe as i read it i don't remember i'm not very 100 percent sure but he must be a one the first one who has wrote by blessing of uh, brahma i think i'm not sure but i think Anyway, it's name, the name is Valmiki Ramayana. I wonder if it's okay to read that. And the next question is, uh, there, there are everything what happened, uh, like uh, for, uh, for, uh, uh, old, uh, for to, to make the, our own food and so on and so on. There are some country that their uh, environment uh, government doesn't give, uh, doesn't allow you to, uh, to do uh, the way which you believe is good, which is uh, healthy, and so on. They have their role and uh, regulation. And I wonder, 
because of that, so it will be very difficult to do it. Is it, could it be it's everything still is by Lord Krishna's sanction to make it this way that, that I don't know, to wake us up maybe something? Maj stepped away from his desk. He will come back, Mataji. I understand. It's okay. Fine. Uh, Valmiki Ramayan is the authorized version of Ramayan. And so you can read that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I, any other questions from devotees before we end this class? Any thoughts that's coming <clears throat> that's coming to your mind that you would like to be clarified? If there isn't, Maharaj, would you like to end with the round of chanting, Maharaj, or would you do you have an appointment? Um, be right back. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, Hare Krishna. Prabhu, do you have a question, Prabhu? Could please go ahead. Uh, yes, Maharaj. So I just wanted to ask: uh, Is it true that Sita Devi stayed with Valmiki in his ashram, and that's how he knew the story of Ramayan? Um, it's true, and yeah, she gave birth in his ashram to her the two sons. And um, the second part sounds right, but I'm not sure if it is. Um, that's a good point. You'd have to investigate farther. But you would think, how did he know all of these different pastimes? He heard from someone, obviously. Okay. Jai Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadar, Har, Sri Vasudhi Gaur, Bhakti Vrindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Krishna Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, <laughs> Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare
Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityan, Mandar Sri Advaita Gadar, Har Sri Vasudhi, Gaur, Vakarinda. Thank you so much, Mark, for such a wonderful class. And we thank the devotees thank for you joining very, very us. Much for today. And we thank you all for participating and asking your wonderful questions. Vancha Kapti Biascha, Kripa Sindha Bevacha, Patita Nam Bhava Nebhya, Vaishnava Bevya, Namo Namaha, Shika Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Chandra Mali Swami Ki Jai. Jai. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, 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 and we just lost Madan Gopal. Okay. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. See you tomorrow. Hare Krishna. See you tomorrow. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.